Welcome, everybody. Thank you also for the invitation. I'm very happy to be a part of this great event. And as you said, we have to 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 look into other disciplines and bring all our knowledge together to hopefully at the end get a good idea of how it is and how it works. So I will talk about uh, fiber today. I'm a nutritionist. I love fiber, of course. Okay, now work. Everything I say is my personal opinion. Um, and my goal today is to show you the relevant fibers you can use in your daily practice, how to use them, which um, patients would be ideal for using them. And I have been using them since uh, I started in nutrition ever since. And there are so many cases where they can sometimes be miraculous, sometimes help. So I, I think we really should not miss this piece of um, puzzle in the whole concept. I bring uh, have brought some cases as well to um, yeah show you different aspects. I will focus on cellulose and psyllium as these are the most common uh, and available fiber, I guess, all over the world. So probably we all, everybody has heard this, that dogs are designed to eat meat, which is often the basis for a lot of speculation about the ideal dog food. And if we first look at what we have to digest, there's a difference between animal cells and plant cells, as animal cells only have a membrane and plant cells have a cell wall. So for enzymatic digestion, it's pretty easy to go th through the cell membrane, whereas for plant cells, we are just not equipped with the necessary enzymes, and we have to rely on bacteria, which will break down these um, cell walls. You can see here all the bacteria attached from an electro uh, microscope image. So they will do the job for us, open it, and then our we can go and digest the interior of the plant cells. So in consequence, digestion of plant materia is a little bit more complicated and it's also more time consuming. And um, if we are able to, to have very fine particles, it would be faster. And with this in mind, um, if we look at different, um, the different uh, anatomical features in herbivores and carnivores, they are obviously differences and uh, also which show very well these different digestive digestive concepts. Herbivores have uh, very large intestines. They have usually fermentation chambers where they uh, will delay the, the retention time for uh, to enhance the digestion. And also they can grind their food very fine. They have sophisticated dental structures. They can make lateral movements with the jaw. All this um, dogs and cats cannot. So this, the digestive system is pretty simple, and we probably should better say that they are not designed to eat plants. And if we give a coarse plant material food to a dog, to an animal with a relatively simple digestive tract and with no chewing ability, like in this case, it is a, a five-year-old Bolognese, then a it will come out right or almost like it went in. So I think for um, the vets here, if you would just see this feces, you would probably think, think that this dog must have a severe mild digestion or maybe a pancreatic insufficiency. But if you know how the food looked before, then it's pretty normal. The dog is not um, ill. It just has a, a crazy food. And one interesting um, thing about this case was also that the owner actually milled the food in the coffee mill before, grinded it in the coffee mill before um, giving it to him to see what happens. And you can see that only by doing this, it already enhances the digestibility. So particle size and um, retention time matters for every species. Anyway, um, so we have carnivores and the question is, what about fiber? If they don't really can't digest them, should they have them anyway? And the answer is clearly yes. Um, not only because our cats and dogs live in different environments, behaviors have different housings, challenges, nutrition. They most often are not fed with prey animals. And uh, there are 
I don't want, will not go in detail this, but there are some hints in the literature that there might be something called animal fiber. So um, something about it also for carnivores, which might play um, a role like for, um, for the herbivores. And the NRC, which is somehow the Bible for every nutritionist, um, where you can find all the information about every nutrient, um, stated that although dietary fiber is not required as a nutrient, it is directly involved in maintaining gut health of cats and dogs. So it is very important to have this included. And this fact is um, not least because diarrhea from a fiber-free diet will be nullified if you just add um, cellulose. So fibers are structure building components from plants that can't be broken down by the enzyme system of the body. This is not everything fiber um, is all about. It's very, it has many, many different aspects, characteristics, functions. We are heard yesterday a very interesting topic on this as well. I don't want to, um, I want to make it simple for you. So you have to, to focus or to keep in mind, there are actually three key features, uh, the fermentability, the solubility, and the viscosity of a fiber. And this will lead to different uses and different indications. So we will go through this. The fermentability refers to the ability to be fermented by the microbes in the colon, especially of dogs and cats. This will result in the production of short chain fatty acids, which will be beneficial for the host. So we have a prebiotic effect. The solubility refers to the ability to dissolve in water. And as a general rule of thumb, um, the higher the sol solubility, the higher the fermentability. And the viscosity um, last will depend on the water binding capacity of a fiber and also on the solu solubility. If you if we compare here inulin and pectin, which are two uh, fermentable fiber, inulin is soluble but has no water binding capacity. So you see, it's if you mix it with water, it stays like it stays watery. Whereas pectin uh, can bind water as well, and it will make a sticky, viscous um, mass. Same for cellulose and psyllium. I will show you this later. So if you have a uh, um, fiber high in viscosity, water binding, this will um, add bulk to, um, to the food or to the digester. Fermentable prebiotic fiber are more available in fruits or vegetables. For example, um, shikori is well known as the main source for inulin. Inulin is a very popular fermentable fiber. I guess everybody has heard about it, as well as phos and moss, which are, are often used. Pectin and guar are also very common, I think. The fermentation substrates, as I already mentioned, are um, served for the gut bacteria. Um, and the bacteria, actually, they some of them feed on a very broad spectrum, and some are very uh, selective, like lactobacillus and bifidobacterium, like um, mostly inulin. So also here, same as for probiotics, I guess it's always good to have a, a mixture, mix, mixture of different fiber types. Butyrite um, is, serves as a primary source for the colonocytes, so this is important for the gut as well. And whenever you have something which will be fermented, there will be gas production somehow. So of course, uh, also in the gut, and if, if it's high fermentable and you have a high dose, it's or overdose, it can lead to flatulence and or diarrhea. So you have to keep this in mind as well. And if this can happen, it's according to the amount you will give. The non-fermentable <clears throat> fiber is more available in cereals. Cellulose, it's very popular, lignocellulose, psyllium, or different husks from soybeans or other, um, other um, stuff. Uh, it will pass the intestinal tract undigested. So this will eat, add bulk to either the food, which will very much help for satiety. So it's important in obesity cases, or it will um, um, bring at bulk to the pieces, with, which itself will stimulate the bowel movement. It can prevent the con constipation. It might help with anal sac problems as well. And due to the water binding, it can improve the fecal consistency. So I call this cosmetic effect of fecal cosmetics 
which is very, very often very helpful. So for you and roughly speaking, we divide the fiber in the fermentable ones and the non-fermentable ones. So the first, uh, whenever you want to do anything good, in best case for the microbiome, you will uh, want to have fermentable fibers. And in any case, you want to uh, have an impact on the intestinal motility or the fecal consistency, you will um, use bulk fiber. We have... Uh, what somehow that feels like hundreds of different fiber types. Um, so they all have um, themselves different um, properties in terms of fermentability or solubility. So um, usually it's good to have a mixture and it's also what you will find in the in commercial dog and cat food. Usually you will have um, uh, a variety of different fiber sources. I will um, have highlighted in green everything which can add fiber in this um, ingredient list. So it will be used for just the normal healthcare. We have it almost in every dry food at least for the right balance. For senior dogs and light formulations, we, we find them, we have them more in dry food than in wet food. I will show you why. And we also use them for functional purposes like anti-hairball or dental care products as well. And of course, in many, many uh, health issues like obesity, diabetes, of course, and the whole range of different digestive orders. So I already mentioned there are differences between um, kibble and wet food. And if you look at the typical ingredients in dry food, we have by itself a relatively high amount of carbohydrates, which by nature will already uh, bring uh, a certain amount of fiber with them. Whereas in wet food, you usually only have a very few amount of vegetables or cereals. It's also not really for the dog itself, it's more for the owner to have uh, an, another appearance. So wet food in general and normal wet food, not the diets, will be um, by nature more low, lower in fiber than in um, than dry food. And also um, if fiber sources are used in wet food. It's more for, um, let's say, also cosmetic reasons as gelling agents. Um, Bua gums and pectin um, is often used for this. These two manufacturers, you see, they didn't use them, and this is what then can come out, so it's still watery. Um, here's to show you uh, Bua and pectin in detail, which, as I said, is uh, used in, in um, in wet foods, it is very uh, highly fermentable. Um, here again, the video of pectin, and if you um, yeah, if you touch it, it's really sticky. So it's it can have side effects like flatulence and softer stools. And the acceptance, to my experience, is not very high due to the stickiness, especially in dogs which have beards or pets they don't really like it. Guar is is really, really, really sticky. Um, I didn't even steer it pretty well. You can still see it, but it's very, um, it has a high viscosity. So um, I guess you could have brought even more water. Each is 20 gram of powder and uh, steered with 200 milliliter of water. So you can see the difference by different fiber types. To uh, give you an idea of typical fiber content in normal food, we have on a dry matter base for um, healthy animals, we want to have around 1 to 2%. Senior diets will be usually a bit higher, up to 5%, and the calorie restricted diets will usually be above 10% on a dry matter basis. And this uh, can matter, actually, and I will show you the second case. It's a mixed breed male, castrated, uh, almost nine kilos, six years old, and he's a, suffers, he has a food intolerance or an allergy with cutaneous and intestinal symptoms. He is uh, on an insect-based wet diet, which he tolerates very, very well, but the problem is that he tends to lose weight, although he gets two cans, 800 gram, which is just by feelings, a little, uh, pretty much for a little dog like this. So the the owners were concerned about nutritional deficiency, 
And the vet dermatologist who referred this case to me and asked for advice was concerned about the energy supply, of course. And me, I was um, firstly um, concerned about the digestibility of the food because if there's no reason why this dog would need such a high amount of food for a very high activity and there's no other um, reason like maldigestion or any other um, disease, then it, there's a high chance that it's the food. And insect-based diets are not, not very common yet, at least uh, in Germany, so we don't have that much experience. However, lots of uh, manufacturers, uh, we have lots of different products. Anyway, um, I looked, if you look at the composition of this um, uh, wet food, we have quite a lot of fiber containing components, carrots, zucchini, lentils, peas, and chard. And I always calculate the calorie amount of the dog, which he would need uh, on a mean base and which he actually gets on the food. So it's almost the double amount of what he would need. You can also see here that the fiber content of this food is 1.5%, which is pretty much, but not a su uh, surprise if we look at the composition. And to remind you, um, to remember that in this uh, special food, dog food, we have uh, almost five-fold amount of vegetables than a regular one. And of course, then the fiber content will be high. So this case was just a low digestibility of the food. And it's good if we don't miss this and have an idea of typical amounts. So now we, I would like to go more in detail um, on the two main uh, fibers. So you can mostly divide two indi indications. You, for most of the cases, you can use a bulk uh, fiber, cellulose obsidium. One, one of the two is is will all, will will probably always work. You can use it just as a fiber supplement, like in uh, cases where um, you have low fiber diets, or in older animals. If you just want to enhance the peristaltis, you don't especially need to change the food. Of course, you can always do this, but you could also just add it to a food which is uh, well tolerated. And in the dietetic um, field. It's just to to consider, do I want to give something to the microbiota? Do I want to make the pieces um, softer in chronic constipation cases? Um, then I would also go for a prebiotic, so for a fermentable fiber. Cellulose is a polymer of um, glucose bonded by beta 1.5 linkage. This is the reason why uh, our enzyme, enzymes can't break it. It's ancillary insoluble, it's non-fermentable, so usually you, you will not um, have um, flatulence problems. It has a high water binding capacity and you have it can find it in different formulations. This one here on the plate, on each plate you have 20 gram and the one here in the back, it's granulated cellulose, which will typically be used for uh, commercial pet food. This one here in front is a granulated uh, cell lignocellulose, and this is a powder cellulose, and the one I mostly use in my patients. And you see it's pretty dusty, but um, yeah, <laughs> otherwise. And we also have different fiber lengths of cellulose, and there's a nice study uh, performed already 20 years ago in Munich um, on different fiber lengths in vegan dogs. They The dogs were on a regular... Um, diet with uh, cooked grapes, cooked corn, starch, sunflower oil, and uh, mineral vitamin supplement. And in total, they get three different, uh, six, sorry, different formulations of uh, fiber lengths to the diet. And the lighter bars um, represent liquid or soft feces, and the um, darker bars, the well-formed one. And there are two things we can conclude from the study. The first, apparently, different fiber um, effects on different fiber have, has different effects on the feces. With everything above 200 micrometer, uh, seems to work very well. And the second one is that none of the control group here had um, had well formed feces. So again, fiber-free diets 
will have a bad fetal consistency. Um, you can overdose it as well. On the left, this is the picture from the study. Um, it's an old picture, or way before. Oops. Um, and on the right, it's the overdosage. Personally, I never had this in in all my years of uh, nutritional practice to have an overdose. But just to mention, to always go slow with this. Um, in terms of overdosing, I had a funny case with a cat owner who sent me this um, pictures. So he bought our cellulose and uh, accidentally gave the cat the whole amount uh, in once. And the next day it was vomiting this weird stuff. He thought it was, might be worms, but as the cat was um, just dewormed a couple of weeks ago, he said, oh, maybe it's the cellulose. Anyway. It was uh, it was worms. Maybe the cellulose just added to bring out what had to be brought out. But this is a nice transition to one uh, major uh, advantage of cellulose: um, the high acceptance in especially cats, but also dogs. It tastes like nothing. It's it's odorless. The only thing it's dusty, but it doesn't have any other disadvantage. And more moreover, as it's a as it is a purified um, fiber, it has no nutritional value, like uh, in contrast to husks, where which you will always have a um, certain amount of phosphorus. So especially in older patients where you might not always want to add phosphor to the diet, cellulose is a very good um, fiber. The dosage is very simple. It's uh, 1.5 to 1 gram per kilogram body weight per day, according to the desired effect. So you can just Start slowly and then go further as high as you, as depends on what you want. If you want to have a satiety effect, you will probably go very high. If you just want a fecal cosmetic effect, you don't need to go that high. The tolerance is individual, so we have to men, um, look for the patients at the beginning or to tell the owners. Increase it always slowly. That's always a good thing with every fiber to, to do it, especially if the dog is not used to it. It's the same for humans, if you ever have tried this. Um, it's important also to mention that it has to be divided into the daily portions. You can mix it in wet food or steer it with water, broth, anything you want. And um, yeah, the fiber length above 200 micrometer would be good. So we have two main indications. Fecal cosmetics is one of the most important. And for the owners, the um, pieces consistency and the volume is almost the only true indicator of intestinal, intestinal health and also of food quality. So it's important and we have to consider this. Um, the symptomatic effect is due to the water binding. It's uh, very effective. It's very immediate as well. Um, it mitigates the problem for the animal and the owner, as the dog will um, it will be easier for the dog to 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 hold the pieces and for the owner to remove them. So the ideal perfect uh, would be the stress uh, colitis patient, for example. Dietary supplement for low fiber diets would also be very good. Re regular wet food. I have a. Uh, Example also here from my practice, very old case, almost um, was in 2015, so it's seven years ago. Ago, it was a, a, a small 55 kilo St. Bernard's mixed breed, Lotte, very cute one, one and a half year, and um, she had a food allergy and was on a homemade diet of venison meat, cooked potatoes, oil, and the vin vitamin mineral mixtures. With this, she did really well. Um, her symptoms, mo mostly uh, gastrointestinal symptoms, improved to, let's say, 80%, but she still had some remaining symptoms like mukoid thesis, sour smelling, irregular defecation frequency, and frequent grass eating. So, um, of course, it could be maybe an, still an aller aller allergic component, but if we look at the fiber contact and it's fresh meat as well as cooked potatoes, there's not really much fiber in. So, calculated amount would be about 0.7% of dry matter. And remember, we, we want something about one and two. So, we can consider that this is pretty low. And just by adding 20 gram for this huge dog, which is about four to five tablespoons, um, it improved uh, very nicely. The, the defecation frequency, you could uh, set the clock. Um, the owner told me there were no more grass eating, no more mookie pieces. The smell was 
better and um, the deification time was very regular. So also very nice case, very easy to solve. Don't need to change the diet just to need to, to know about this. Constipation is also something something where you can use it, uh, of course, um, if there's still motility in the gut. It might be better for cats um, due to the higher acceptance than psyllium. So just try it out. Second indication is overweight. I don't want to go too much in detail to this, but the half of the of the dogs and cats are overweight. So we can also use this in these in a lot of cases. Um, it will um, make an energy dilution, reduce the digestibility, stimulates the mot intestinal mot motility, and due to the higher food volume, you will have a satiety effect, especially in cats, but also in, in dogs and in the owners uh, as well. So the other very important fiber, and I guess most of you probably have uh, uh, used this um, maybe a couple of times, um, it's more common also in the studies, you find psyllium more often, at least to my um, impression. So it's a plantain species from India. Um, it's almost odorless and almost tasteless. I think it has a little taste. Um, the husk contain uh, mucilage and um, it, these are very rich in soluble fiber, but apparently very the, these fiber, although they are soluble, are not very fermentable. So it's uh, it has a certain fermentability, but not as high as in other ones. It's functional fiber and the water binding capacity is very high, more than 10 times its weight. What you see here again is 20 gram of psyllium husk and 200 milliliter of water and it makes a very sticky appearance. In German, we say flea seeds, uh, which uh, appears to how it looks like. The daily dosage is uh, the same than for cellulose, um, increase slowly, distributed uh, across the meal, steered with water. Uh, it's important to leave it swell for a sufficient long time as this uh, indifference to cellulose as well. Um, milled husk, I like to use them, will swell uh, much quicker. On the pictures you see uh, the same set, um, um, psyllium 20 gram, 200 milliliter of water. And on the second one, we added 400 milliliter of water. So you can just go higher and higher. Provide enough drinking water. It's uh, important. And some owners reported that the first day, um, the feces is like a change that sometimes the dogs have a little problems in the beginning to defecate. Flatulence might occur. Um, yeah, keep this in mind. And this is a picture from a nice um, study uh, from Moreno et al um, on psyllium. So you see how this looks like. This is from an overdose. I uh, unfortunately don't know how much it was overdosed, but uh, it's just to mention, not to hear you, but just to show you, um, be aware of overdosing can occur. And sometimes it's just a misunderstanding of, from the owner. So give good advice. Um, uh, what did I have inside? As book, I already said that cosmetic water binding. Um, the mucilage you have might reduce inflammatory irritations. That's just my personal guess. I, I will try this out. Um, um, we have to try this out more often, but maybe this might help. Uh, I like to use um, uh, psyllium husks um, in these cases. I call them empty stomach syndrome, where they vomit in the morning because they just don't have anything in the stomach. So uh, to increase um, the or to slow the gastric emptying, uh, I really much like psyllium. There is a very um, new study as well. I have to show you because fiber can act as antibiotics bearing option. And we already talked a bit about uh, antibiotics and we have to be careful in giving these. In this study, um, they had almost 60 client owned dogs, which were randomly divided in three groups. Um, they all get a high, a easy digestible diet. Um, the first group got a placebo, the second group got metronidazole, and the third group got also the placebo and on top a fiber enriched easy digestible diet. And if you see the remission time here, just by looking at it, 
Um, you see that the, the diet is um, better than the one with the midrena, so there's no advantage. And the, the, the quickest you had in just the fiber enhanced diet. So this is really, really important that we that we start using this. I would like to show you difference um, between psyllium and cellulose. Um, if you steer it, just to give you an idea of, of the consistency, when you have it in the food, you will have the same consistency in the gut as well, because if you try to squeeze it, there's no water coming out. It's really bound. So there's nothing to do about it. Whereas in cellulose, it's more um, like paper um, slush. Uh, and if you squeeze this, you can see that you can still, um, that the water is somehow still available. So in terms of pieces consistency, typically um, you might have this rubbery appearance with psyllium and this dry um, appearance on um, cellulose. So my to finish, uh, my last patient is Anton. It's a very nice um, case. Uh, he was from a veterinarian colleague also four years ago. Uh, it's a young poodle, male, um, a little bit more than 20 kilo, and he has um, digestive problems since puppy age. He always had um, very soft, sticky, cow patty, all smelling uh, pieces like you see here on the picture. Um, the first defecation in the morning was firm, but then it gets worse and worse uh, the longer the day. And the picture here you see actually was uh, one of the good days. So um, from the brief history, he had um, a geodosis at puppy age, uh, which was treated with fenbendazole. Um, he had a supposed dysbiosis, but we only had this diagnosis on be uh, fecal bacteria culture um, results. So unfortunately, we didn't have the dysbiosis index at that time, which would have been very interesting. Um, he had various food changes without any success. What worked best was uh, giving him fresh meat with cooked potatoes or cooked rice. And currently he's getting three meals per day with a mixture of uh, 250 grams of kibbles and uh, one, um, wet, uh, one can of wet food. Uh, he gets quite a lot of different treats, actually uh, almost 100 gram per day. And finally the owner wasn't really aware of that. She only uh, noticed this when she was filling out my, my, um, my questionnaire, my formula. And uh, the reason why Anton gets this high amount of treats was because of what he was a very picky eater. Like to my experience, almost every poodle, no matter if it's a great one or a small one. Um, and so this is the what we have. And we have to think about, could he have a food allergy or could he have a food intolerance? Of course, he can also have something else. But uh, me as a nutritionist, I will try to sort this out, which would be more likely. A food allergy for me seems pretty unlikely. There were no differences on any of the elimination diets the owner did. And as the owner is a vet, I can assume a very high compliance. So um, I don't think it's that. Food intolerance is much more likely, especially if um, we consider that on one side, he had quite a lot of treats. He also had quite a lot um, of protein in his diet, almost the double amount of his requirement. And this is an old study very nicely where the dogs were fed different um, food protein contents um, of different sources. And we see that um, the group which had, a, a let's say, a normal regular um, protein amount with uh, good uh, protein sources, high quality sources, they had all well-formed pieces, whereas in the other group, they were unformed and soft. And also we have an impact on the microflora apparently, so this is interesting as well. And if we look at different digestibilities of different ingredients, the higher the amount of connective tissue, we can say the, the lower the digestibility and a reduction of only 10% will already double the feces volume. So with this in mind, the food intolerance seems very, very likely. I have seen this lots of cases, not as beautiful as in this case, but in very lots, uh, many cases that uh, these low digestible treats 
have a negative impact on the thesis uh, consistency. And if you don't have this in mind and you will go through diagnostic, you will never really be able to solve the problem because you, you, you don't um, have the right reason. Um, the, the hints we have that the fresh food also worked best. So this is uh, also something which made me think of this uh, moral intolerance. Um, she tried also uh, fresh cheese as a treat, which worked pretty well, whereas the soft, soft sprites were really uh, very bad. So my only and first feeding instruction for the owner was to give him any more chews like raw hides and all this kind of stuff. She could give treats, but I said, just give her, give him anything from the fridge. And so human um, food like the cheese. And that was the first advice. After two weeks, she sent me this picture and she was really amazed after years of this um, horror she, she went through that um, he never had a, um, a bad fecal consistency anymore. He only defecated once uh, a day and this is still after year, four years um, the case. So to conclude, um, digestibility is crucial for different patients. You have to keep this in mind, please. Check the diet of your patients, especially before you go on um, expensive diagnostic. If it's the diet, uh, probably it will um, respond very quickly. So if you have some time to, to wait, um, if it's not so ur an urgent patient, give it a chance. Um, same for fibers, they are really must-haves. Uh, every GI patient should have fibers. Uh, if you consider antibiotics, think of fiber first, maybe, or a diet. Um, we have positive effects, as I showed you from the study, uh, within a couple of days. So this is nice for colitis patients. And um, the fiber type, just give it according to the symptoms or the desired effects you want to have. If you want a cosmetic effect, try cellulose. It would be my first choice. Or if, you, uh, if cellulose is not available, try um, psyllium. If you want to support the intestinal flora, a mixture would be good with inulin or something like that, cosmos, whatever, maybe psyllium. We are not, it's not very clear if, um, if it's uh, fermentable uh, or how much it is fermentable. If you have mucosal damage, you might uh, want to try psyllium. Um, if you want to delay the gastric emptying or enhance the satiety, psyllium and cellulose would be very uh, great. General dosage, again, very easy, roundabout, smaller amounts for every GI patient. It has to be in every diet for every animal and any species. Um, and the higher amounts you can try to um, in colitis patients or the fiber responsive diarrhea constipation, some of them. So just try it out. It's always about the balance in nutrition. And um, yeah, I hope I, I yeah, could show you some practical um, facts about fiber. Use it, take it from tomorrow on. I'm happy to take questions and I thank you for your attention.